Hello, my name is Derek from Tomcat Gas Training and welcome to this video on the best of inside a boiler casing. Now I get asked quite a lot on the comments section how to do all these different tests but they're in loads of different other videos so I'm trying to put some together so you guys can get an idea on how to test different components in boilers. So in this video we're going to be looking at testing air pressure switches or fan proving switches. We're going to be looking at testing MTCs or thermistors. We're going to look at two different diverter valves. We're going to look at one in a glowworm and one in a valent. We're going to be looking at removing the burner from an Ariston and we're also going to be looking at removing the fan from uh, a Worcester. And then finally we're going to be removing a pump from a Velen. So that's what we've got in this video. So hopefully you're going to enjoy it. So let me stop waffling and let's just get on with it. So this is the fan pressure switch. Now, how the fan pressure switch works is not what you'd expect it to be. So basically, when the boiler switch is on, the pump comes on, okay? Then the PCB checks to see if we've got continuity actually at the air pressure switch between our common and our normally closed. Now, if it did it between our common and normally open, then we would be able to bridge out um, the air pressure switch and leave it, which we can't do that because it's a safety device. If you bridge out a safety device, you make that appliance automatically ID in that um, unsafe situations procedure. So IGMG 11 would deem that immediately dangerous. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we'll have a close look before we take it out and then we're going to take it out and then we're going to check it on the bench. So let's get on with it. Now, as you can see, this is our air pressure switch. Now remember, this black lead here is what went onto the fan. Okay, and you can see there's also a clear lead which goes out of the back. And that just goes out of the back of the combustion chamber. Okay, if we look on the side, you can see there's three connections but there's only two wires. So we've got a brown wire going to that connection. We've got nothing on the center wire, uh, on the center connection. And then we've got this blue wire, which goes onto this back connection. So when we take them off, we'll have a look what all these connections are. But one would be common, one would be normally closed, one would be normally open. And then on these two connections here, one would be positive, one would be negative. Okay, so it's dead easy to take off. There's literally one screw here at the top. Pull off these two wires, pull off this cable, and then we can get out on the bench and have a look. Now, first thing is I'm gonna take off the screw on the top here, which is gonna drop down the air pressure switch. Hopefully I'm not blocking what I'm doing. Okay, so that was simple enough. I'm now going to pull off the clear tube, but I'm going to leave the black one connected. So that's off. And all I've got to do now is the, take the brown wire off, the blue wire, and that's the air pressure switch out. Okay, so we'll get it upstairs and get it tested, and we'll see if this Honeywell valve is still working. Now let's have a look at this air pressure switch a bit more closely. So if I zoom in, you can see now that this here, this one here, is our common. So this one had the brown wire connected to it. This one says normally closed. This didn't have any wires connected to it at all. And you can see this says normally open the NO, which had our blue wire connected to it. So you can now see the different switches. So hopefully I'm going to explain how this works. Now, got a multimeter here got it set on audible alarm so when I touch the two leads together we should get a noise so we know that's working now then when you get this out of your van the first thing you need to do is check we have continuity between the common and the normally closed which we have straight away okay if you don't have that to start with between the common and the normally closed then you're wasting your time. 
So we shouldn't have any continuity between common and normally open, which you can see there isn't. There is on that one, but there isn't on that one. And there shouldn't be anything between these two. The normally open and normally closed, which there isn't. Okay, now, if we look at this tube, I flip it over, you can see it says uh, high there and low there. Okay, now this black tube we know was attached to the fan. So the fan is actually, by the aid of Venturis, sucking the pressure switch open rather than uh, pushing it open. Okay, so I told you before we should never be sucking on an air pressure switch, but I've got to do that to uh, show you how it works. So we should have continuity between these two. And when I suck on the air pressure switch, we should lose continuity between these two, but gain it between the bottom one and the top one. Okay, so let's have a go at that first. So you can see as I sucked on the tube, we lost continuity. So that side's working. Okay, so now then, what we should do is when I suck on the tube, is gain continuity between that one and that one. So let's try that. So no continuity at the moment. Ooh, we're not gaining anything. So this air pressure switch is actually not working. So let's prove it on one what I do know is working, which is this is the same air pressure switch. Okay, so we're just gonna do the same tests again, which we have, and between the bottom one and the common. So they're normally open and the common, we should have nothing, which we haven't. So if I suck on the tube, we should lose the continuity here and gain it here. So that part works. Let's try the bottom bit. So you can see that one works perfectly. Okay. So just remember, don't test them by sucking on the tube because you could damage the diaphragm. But uh, hopefully that shows you how to test the air pressure switch and what you should be looking for. As promised, I'm going to show you how to check this NTC, negative temperature coefficient. Um, so basically this is the thermistor. And what this does is it reads the temperature and sends a signal in homes back to the PCB. So that can tell the burner whether to... Uh, or the fan to speed up or slow down to give more gas or not. So the way we check these, now today is it's about 30 degrees in this classroom. I've got my little thermometer here. So my little thermometer here and it's reading just under 30 degrees. Okay. So we need a chart. So we've got our little chart here which is going to tell us what our home reading should be at a given temperature. Now, according to this, 30 degrees, we were looking at a resistance in homes of 9,786, or around about there. Okay, now, because this is a negative temperature coefficient resistor, what it'll do is, as the temperature gets hotter, the reading will come lower. So the colder the water is, the higher the reading, the hotter the water is, the lower the reading. So we need a multimeter, and you can see I've set my multimeter on to 20K. Okay, I'm just going to check and make sure it works, so the screen should change. Okay, so you can see the screen's changing, so we know this is working. So I'm just going to take a reading now on what the temperature is here now so it doesn't matter which way around you're going but I'm going to look up for these holes I'm trying to be handy if I had a pair of eyes so I've got a reading on my screen of 9.60 9.60 9 
So it's 9.62, okay? And according to my chart, for 30 degrees, 9.78, okay? So it's not a million miles out. Now, what I'm going to do here is I've got a cup of cold water and this reading now is 19.6 in this cold water, 19.6. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the NTC and I'm going to dip it in the water for a little bit just so it gets the temperature of the water. And this should be a different reading. And if it's got a different reading, then it means this, the uh, NTC is working. Okay. So it's been in there a few seconds now. Let's not bother about the water. And let's take the new reading quickly before it starts to warm up again. And we've got a reading of 11.8. Two. And you can now see the reading on the screen is coming down because it's warming up. So you can actually see this is working. There is nothing wrong with this thermistor at all. Now you shouldn't really test them while they're on the boiler. Okay, but um, they're dead easy to take off the, the dry pocket. And the wet pocket one are exactly the same, except you have to get rid of the water out of the boiler first before you check them. Now, this is about one degree out from a wet pocket. So what the manufacturer gains in lack of sludge and affecting these, they gain in lasting longer um, while they're on the boiler. So that's how you check a negative temperature coefficient resistance resistor thermistor, uh, thermistor. And you will need a chart and a multimeter and some way of checking the temperature to be able to do it. But if you do get a change in reading, then you know it's working. Now, I'm just going to use these grips to take the end off here. Um, I have slackened them off a little bit. So it should come off. Technically, you could do this while it's while it's still in position, and technically, I could have just taken the um, the the plate off to get the clip out. But I needed to strip it to see what it's looked like anyway, because it didn't work. So. Ooh. So, it's not massively dirty. So that's how it fits inside and how it works. So, oh, it's just crusty and not looking good. So, it looks like. It needs completely changing. So that pin, <laughs> that pin should be loose. So that oof, should slide freely inside there. So what happens is the motor pushes that in the chamber in there, blocking the chambers off, and it was stuck solid. So, as you could see. So, that just needs a new kit. So, we're going to remove this burner. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. First thing we're going to do is I'm going to remove the HT lead. Now, you don't remove it from here. We do need to remove the earth clamp, but we actually remove it from the PCB. So, this is the lead going to from the PCB ign ignition uh, through to the HT. So, I'm going to remove this silencer. So, this silencer just twists off, and you can now see inside the silencer. Okay, so that's the blue silencer. There is a sponge in there, and you should check the sponge every service to make sure it hasn't deteriorated or broken. Now, electrical connections we've basically got one plug on the fan, which I'm trying to get off. 
So there's a plug on the phone. Okay, so it also leaves, there's a clip here on, on this side to, to remove the, um, the gas coming in from the gas valve. So it's just a straightforward plug, he said. Pull that. So we've pulled the retaining clip off. Okay, so that means now that all I've got to do is I should have to just undo these four 10 milli nuts. So these aren't nylock nuts like uh, they are on the, the valent. But they are pretty tight. The manufacturer's instructions are slightly different than others I've seen. They don't tell you how to strip this, they show you in a series of pictures. Now all I have to do now is pull forward. And out it comes. How easy was that? Okay, so again we can see there is a cup burner. Again it burns 360. You can see this is, uh, the insulation is quite a lot thicker than what it is on the valent. Now this gasket, which you can see here, this gasket here, we don't have to change every time we uh, take this off. The manufacturer says if it's damaged or looks uh, corroded, corroded, deteriorated, then you should change it, but it looks in pretty good condition. This gap here for the spark electrode, we have to check on service, and that has to be about three mil. Yeah, about the gap of a, a pound coin, or the old pound, pound, pound coin. Easy for me to say. Now this is where our gas connection is coming in. Now, if we wanted to turn this uh, boiler into LPG, this is where we would put our restrictor into here. It's so easy to turn this boiler into LPG. You don't even have to tell it on the on the PCB that it is. You've you've done it. All you have to do is adjust the gas valve, and you can see the gas valve has stayed in position now. Okay, so that was how easy removing the burner was. Turn the gas off for it. Now, first thing I need to do is remove this pin here. So, let's get a flat screwdriver. So, let's uh, get this pin out here. Okay, so quite easy, this is a quick release on the gas. So the pin comes out, and this gas pipe now pulls off. Now, holding the actual um, fan and um, assembly in is basically just this one nut and these wires here. So I'm just going to disconnect the wire from here and from here. Okay. So I need to take this nut now off. So it's a 13 milli spanner. That's the nut off, and then there's a retaining clip here, which you also need to remove off. So that now will make it so I can pull this forward. Let's just get rid of that drip. So it unclips, and then just lift it out. Now, how easy is that to take out? So now we've got this fan out, let's have a look in here a bit more closely. Now we've removed the fan, we can have a closer look now at this uh, valve on the back. So this is where the air comes in for combustion, and this is where our gas is. So while we've got this out, we're supposed to inspect this, make sure it's not cracked or brittle, because we don't want any gas leaks. This is where our test point is coming from the front to do our pressure testing. Now if I wanted to take this off and check the valve inside, what you've got to do is press this tab, to undo this, I'm going to try it with one hand and a foot. So you twist it like that, and then it comes off. And now you can test. So this is a rubber flap here, which has, is a, a can be replaced. And this is what the pressure of, it's only very slight, this is what the suction of the, the fan overcomes to allow the air and the gas in. So the more that opens, obviously, because that's where the gas is coming in, the more the gas and air is going to be coming through so you can see they both come into two chambers at the back here so let's get this off so you can see you can see where they mix where they come through so air on one side gas on the other 
So that's important to check that and make sure it's it's not corroded or it hasn't got any holes in. So that's what the back of the fan looks like and you can see the, the impeller there inside. So that's the fan. Now to remove this pump is pretty straightforward. We're just going to take the head off first. But remember before you do any work whatsoever on the wet side, the water set, you would need to isolate the valves underneath on the flow and return or the cold water coming in, drain the water through the taps and then drain the boiler itself through the drain. So we'll have a look at that when we we'll look underneath later. So there's no water in this boiler so this is dead easy to strip. So all it is now is a matter of undoing these uh, four Allen screw bolts there holding it in. Now, as you can see, this pump is pretty solid. So it's not had any water in for a while. The pump is actually looks in good nick, but you can see how solid that was. Now this is hardwired onto the PCB. So we can't, well, we can undo the wiring from here, but it's just as easy to unplug it from the PCB. So you could do it either way. So that's the pump out. Next thing we're going to look at is the diverter valve. Now the pump head's removed, we can see the diverter valve more closely. So the main thing we need to do with the diverter is remove that screw, that screw. And there is also an awkward screw underneath there somewhere, if you can see it. You'll see it in the background. They actually got Phillips head screws or flat screws. Sometimes they can be seized, sometimes they can be dead easy to get off. Also, what we've got to do is remove this pin here and we have to undo this nut here. This, what you can see here, is the automatic adjustable bypass. When we take the uh, diverter valve off, you'll see where that connects onto. And this is the head, the motor. We're going to strip that off to have a look at that. So first thing to do is get these three screws out. So we also need to remove this, which is a clamp which holds the diverter onto the pump body. So that's out now, let's get these screws out and let's get it stripped. So let's first undo this nut here. Again, this is the water set, again, this is no water, again you have to drain this. So it's the matter of undoing the nut, he says. Inside here is a washer, which we'll need to change. Now we're not going to take the pin out yet, so we're going to leave that off. Um, I'm going to disconnect the wiring. So that's, again, just the clip he says. Just going to do that clip. Okay, I'll explain the difference in these in a bit, so we'll see that in a bit. So I need to get these two, well, three screws out now using a screwdriver. So I'll use... The flat one just to... Okay, now inside the hole there, you should be able to see the motor and how we can get it off. So if we look at this here, this clamp, so you can see how it's shaped. Actually, if I push the shaft back, you should be able to see it. You can see the little ball on the end of there. So that little ball clips onto this, so it goes over the top and clips up. So it can now drive the motor in, or well the motor drives the, the shaft in and shuts off the diverter valve. So if I push the plunger up, so that pushes and closes off the port to allow the water to go around the system. So now we've got that off, we can have a look actually at the plate to plate heat exchange. So this can go into three positions. It can go mid position, which is in the center, which allows you to have heating and hot water. If it goes all the way out, that allows it to go through the plate to plate heat exchanger and if it's shut all the way across it allows the water to come through here and go back into the heating circuit. So the heating circuit would flow through here 
come through, come through here and then go through into the pump. Okay, so that's the why the water would return. So coming up through here. Now the other hole here is the automatic bypass. And that's the end of this first look at the best of inside a boiler casing. Now, apologies for the music guys, I've tried to get rid of the music and I just can't do it. So if anybody does know how to get rid of the music out of those videos, then uh, put it in the comments section below. Now, if you've liked this video, why don't you give me that thumbs up because it shows me you care or leave a constructive comment down below. If you've not subscribed to my channel, then please subscribe because it helps my channel. And don't forget to hit that notification bell because I release videos mainly on a Wednesday. All I've got left to say is, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and look out in the future for more of these going back to inside a boiler casing. Cheers guys!